No comment? <laughs> I'm guessing. <coughs> Any other questions? The um, one thing I'd like to add, um, when we first uh, presented the concept um, offered by Dr. Alice C. Dow, uh, utilization of the continental shelf um, more than 15,000 years ago, um, we were surprised after about a year, year and a half, that the state archaeologists came back with an assessment that the geologic record indicated that um, the continental shelf uh, going back at least 24,000 years ago, was an open um, vegetated plain. And so that um, gave further corroboration to the assertions of the uh, tribal oral history. And um, finally, we've gotten to a point where science and, um, and tradition, uh, tribal tradition, uh, seem to be running parallel, if not hand in hand. So we... Um, Hopefully, we're in, a, we're in a newly dawning day. Well, it sounds like you have years of work ahead of you. Is that, what are, you are you projecting that this will be an ongoing project? Uh, we are currently um, developing a pro process with the University of Rhode Island to have the young people who come through our Tribal Historic Preservation Office and its field work um, acquire degrees and go through the University of Rhode Island and, and gain specialization in the various disciplines of historic preservation, including um, uh, oceanography. So we're looking at uh, generations of continued work, right. yes. Well, yeah, one, one point that I think needs to be made, too, is that the um, the diagrams where I showed a synthesis of the existing data um, some data was gathered by this project since its start a uh, year and a half ago. Um, most of that data, some of it goes back to the uh, uh, 1970s. So there's a lot of leveraging going on here to get to the point where we're at. Uh, and, and, you know, I could actually put a number on it because I tried to figure it out. You know, the amount of um, funding that's gone into uh, amassing the database is several million dollars before this project even started. And I honestly think to stand a, a decent chance of having success with a project, um, you either have to have a budget like that, which is unlikely, or you need to try this in a, in a place where you can leverage a lot of existing information. Starting from scratch really isn't much of an option. So uh, it sounds like you're saying that this this area has been of, of great archaeological interest for uh, for years and years, and so you're able to take advantage of that data that's already been collected. Well, more than that, it, it's leveraging them in multiple ways. Um, a lot of that data was collected as part of a, a marine spatial planning exercise that was aimed at offshore renewable energy development. So when we're doing these projects, we have to be clever about trying to leverage activities like that, which do provide the sort of budgets you need to amass the data you need to look at the cultural landscape piece. If, if you try and get the resources just to look at the cultural landscape alone, I, I don't think you're going to amass enough resources to do it. You have to have some other um, reason for um, looking at the area to actually have the resources you need to do it properly. Right. The, the, the majority of the data that, that's been collected wasn't collected for archaeological assessment purposes. It was collected for a whole variety of other uh, scientific data acquisition uh, uh, goals and needs. Um, what's Something that I've, I've, I'm a, a CRM archaeologist as well, and um, I've been looking at the, the problem of trying to identify submerged paleocultural landscapes for the better part of the last 12 years. And, and one of the things that has been 
possible, made possible, um, and, and, and allowed me to, to pursue this is, is by leveraging uh, the engineering needs for the development projects, the offshore development projects that I worked on, um, that typically require sub-bottom profiling to identify uh, buried substrates that uh, the engineers don't want to have to drill through or plow through, um, and apply the data for archaeological purposes um, to identify these, these old landforms. So every aspect of this type of research uh, really does require um, thinking creatively about how to to uh, utilize the existing information as fully as possible because this is, this is a very different, I was trained as a shipwreck archaeologist and this is a very different type of uh, it's a whole different headset that you need to, to go into this, this research problem with um, where you're, you're not thinking about um, necessarily interfaces with, with coasts and, and ports and shipping routes and looking for isolated things like shipwrecks or traces of uh, patterns of, of, of uh, navigation, but actually really thinking about uh, the water not being there and what, what the seafloor and what's below the surface of the seafloor would be like from a landscape perspective, which is why uh, being able to participate in a conversation like this is so interesting and important because it's, it's essential to the whole process of doing this type of work. It's all about landscape. It's not so much about trying to find the isolated thing as it is trying to understand what's left of the paleocultural landscape so that then you can begin to uh, go about trying to predict and identify uh, cultural deposits. This is Linda McClelland. I was going to ask if you've done any uh, research here with paleobotany and whether that is giving you any ideas about how that land was vegetated and how that uh, might have been used. Um, yeah, this is John. I'm, I'm actually uh, my initial training as a scientist was as a palynologist, so the answer is yes. And uh, I, I, do, I do pollen and plant macrofossils, so uh, we, we are doing those things on this project. Have you found any evidence that gives you some patterns that you think are more are likely to be uh, verified down the road? Um, it, it's a little early yet to, to say yes to that. You know, obviously we're finding plant macrofossils to do AMS dates on, but um, I'm just starting to get into the pollen now. Uh, you know, we sort of have identified uh, European cultural horizons. Uh, it's, a, it's a good site. You know, you can see things like the chestnut blight, the elm blight, the ragweed rise, et cetera. So if there is evidence of um, human habitation further down, I'm sure we're going to find it. And it's been found at other sites, uh, you know, not right around our area, but, you know, in, in uh, southern Canada there has been some pretty elegant studies that show that um, um, corn pollen and even ragweed, which is, which is native, uh, there have been smaller ambrosia rises in the past associated with human activity. And in the southeast, there's, there's slam duck evidence of um, intensive use of the landscape prior to, to European use of the landscape. So uh, I, I think we are going to find some things, but we haven't found them yet. Interesting. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Anything else you would like to add? To your presentation? 